Uh, and welcome everyone to the Construction and Demolition Waste Seminar and Workshops. Uh, we've got a, a, um, a significant array of speakers that are going to address you there, here this afternoon, but I'd just like to say that we're really impressed with the turnout. Welcome to you all, welcome to Unitech, uh, and a warm welcome to the work that's gone in behind the scenes to Terry Ann, Linda, uh, James and your organisation in coordinating such an event. Uh, kaiatia, kai akiakitanga is one of the five values that we cherish and hold dearly here at uh, Unitech. And in essence it means guardianship. So guardianship in this context is um, with the people the environment, knowledge and ob objects, but obviously today we're here to talk about the environment and sustainability within the environment. And we're really proud at Unitech that under the guardianship of uh, Terry Ann, we've established a environmental and sustainable research centre um, within our school and um, the work and research that they do has been instrumental in raising awareness to our students and trying to alter behaviours in terms of uh, the contributions that we make, we make in our day-to-day -day activities in terms of uh, demolition, waste, um, and the discard guarding thereof. So, uh, partnering with the City Council, Naila Love, obvi obviously, uh, a warm welcome to all of the industry, the participants that are here today, um, as um, Kayaki Tana is the caring of our environment, um, we want to welcome you all. We uh, are looking forward to the speakers that are um, scheduled to talk here today, um, and a warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Paul Jerison, who is United Head of School for Building Construction at Unitech here. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank, thank you so much for hosting us here today. Um, my name is Andy Kenworthy. I am emceeing with you throughout the um, evening, not into the evening, late afternoon, should we say. Uh, I'm from the Sustainable Business Network, um, who helped to put this thing together. But this is an entirely collaborative event. And as Paul has already touched on, there are many partners that have made this happen, um, including Auckland Council, Becker, Master Builders, Naylor Love, and, of course, Unitech. 
So this is really just a knowledge sharing thing. We, we wanted to bring you all together to start throwing around some of the information around sustainability in construction and demolition and see what spins out of it. Shortly afterwards, we're going to have um, some light refreshments outside. That's where you can network, make your connections and start making some of this stuff happen. Obviously, it's a hugely important subject. 50% uh, of Auckland's total waste stream is construction and demolition waste. Yep, half the waste out there is coming from this. 80% of it goes straight to, goes to clean fill, 20% to landfill. My father-in-law used to run a clean fill. He's had a lovely retirement. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, the estimate for this year is, for the year 30th of June 2019, is 568,935 tonnes of waste produced. That's 196 Auckland Town Halls. Obviously, you haven't knocked down 196 Auckland Town Halls. We would have noticed. But that's projected to go up by about 3% a year. Um, so that's part of the problem is we're, we're heading on an upwards curve. It's costing something like $100 million a year. That's some of the savings we can kind of pull out of this if we do things differently. And on average, $31,000 worth of materials are wasted on a typical house build around the country, according to a study by AUT. And there's obviously the huge environmental cost. We're all aware of that, the impact all that's having. Um, we need to start to reduce. So that's what we're going to talk about today with a variety of people. We've got a lot of speakers to get through. It's going to be very tight time and it's going to happen really fast. So what we're going to see is people coming up, doing a quick, uh, quick talk. We're going to be marking their time. I will start to move towards them if they take too long. But keep it all in mind. Get the download of information. There are questions in some of the, from some of the longer talks and we'll let you know when that is. If you want to ask a question, please wave at Ayla, who will be running around with a microphone, because we are recording and videoing the event. So if you don't talk in the microphone, it would be like you didn't happen. So it would be good to have you there with us. Um, and so without really further ado, I will ask Jenny to kick us off. Jenny Marshall from the Ministry for the Environment is going to give us an update on what the, what the government's approach to this. We haven't given her much time, so it'll be headlines only. And that's the walk of doom. We're going to do it as fast as we possibly can. Thank you, Jenny. <laughs> Kia ora koutou. Thanks so much for having me here today. I'm going to try and talk even faster than Andy. I don't know if it's physically possible, but I'm going to give it a go. So the government is really actually quite interested in construction demolition. But I think it's really helpful to think about construction demolition. What are we talking about? So from a government perspective, we're thinking about houses. We're thinking about commercial buildings. But we're also thinking about infrastructure. And it's great to see that we've got some people from the City Rail Link here today talking about their project. But often people just think about houses, um, but it's the full gamut that we're thinking about when we think about construction and demolition. I think we all know that we urgently need to change how we're living and working and what we're doing with our waste. Here's obviously the data of Class 1 waste to landfill since 2009. Now you'll be delighted to know that last year waste dropped to landfill. It was like exciting. Why? Because the whole country went into lockdown for a long period of time. And that's the kind of change that we need, the step change we need if we want to really see a reduction in waste to landfill. I always kind of bear in mind that pre-COVID, every year 40,000 new people come to New Zealand. So that's the size of a small city. So if we're actually going to have to reduce waste to landfill, we need to kind of make up for all these extra people who are coming, who need new houses, who need new infrastructure. So. Where do we dispose of our construction and demolition waste? We've got really good data on what we call our class one landfills, but we actually dispose of waste to a variety of different landfills. And that's because different types of waste require a greater or lesser degree of environmental protection. So the best data that we have is on our class one landfills. And what you can see in this green chart here is that rubble and concrete is 20.1%. And I don't know if there's a pointer. So that's the main source of waste to landfill. After that, you've got timber, and then you're kind of dropping down into things like food and garden waste. So it's a huge component of waste to landfill. But what you can see in the chart that's in blue on the right-hand side is how it tracks over time. And I know that's really, really small writing, but basically, food waste and garden waste to landfill over time is decreasing, and wood waste and inert waste, which is construction and demolition types of waste, is increasing over time. That's probably due to two reasons. Firstly, we've got a lot better at reducing our food waste and, and diverting it from landfill. But secondly, we're doing a lot more demolition. We're doing a lot more construction. So not only is waste overall to landfill going up, but the percentage of that waste, which is construction and demolition, is also increasing. So for the last kind of two years, the Ministry for the Environment has been thinking about things from a circular economy lens. And I'm sure most of you are familiar with kind of the traditional circular economy model of materials. 
But I was like, what does circular economy look like for construction and demolition? And I found this online, which I thought was really helpful. And I kind of wanted to very quickly draw your attention to two points which I think are interesting. And the first is about extending the lifetime of buildings and materials. So when we build things these days, how long are we building them for? If you think about 100 years ago, they were trying to build buildings that would last for a long time, significant architectural buildings. These days, how long are we building things for? And I speak from personal experience as someone who had to have their plastic pipes in their house completely taken out, because when they did the pipes in my house in the 1980s, they were like, oh, these should last 60 years. And when the plumber came, he's like, oh, yeah, we've realized that these pipes only last for 30 years now. And so every run around Auckland who's got pipes at the same time as me is having to have them replaced. So we need to think about the lifetime of the materials that we use and the lifetime of our buildings. The other thing that I think is quite interesting is thinking about modularity and repairability. If things do need fixing, can we construct our buildings in such a way that that part that needs fixing can be fixed? So waste reduction is not the only government driver behind our interest in construction and demolition. Emissions reduction is also key. And this chart comes from the European Union, who have calculated that if they move to a more circular economy, they can reduce their CO2 emissions. And I don't know if you can kind of see it well enough, but things like cement recycling, reuse of building components, and once again that prolonged lifetime. So obviously from a government perspective, we're thinking about reducing waste, but we also want to reduce emissions. So it's a whole of government response. So it's not just the Ministry for the Environment that's thinking about construction and demolition, it's a whole of government response. So I'm sure that you've all made your submission to the Climate Change Commission, which is thinking about both waste and about buildings. We've got our emissions budgets and our reduction plans that are due by the end of the year. Most of you hopefully have made a submission to the Infrastructure Commission that was set up last year. Now that Infrastructure Commission is thinking not only about general infrastructure, but it's also thinking about waste infrastructure. What infrastructure do we need so that we can actually recycle construction and demolition waste? And there's a program that you might not be as familiar with, which is the Carbon Neutral Government Program. Put your hand up if that's on your radar. Okay, I'll just spend a bit more time talking about that. So Carbon Neutral Government Program means that every Crown agency and government department needs to report on their emissions. Now why is this important? It's important because the Crown owns a huge amount of assets. We own all the hospitals, we own the schools, we own education facilities, we own the prisons. So the Crown actually owns a huge number of buildings and we commission a lot of infrastructure works. So therefore, if we now need to all report on our emissions, we're going to be looked to see, well, where can we reduce our emissions? So any construction and demolition work that we commission will be a key area of focus. So coming back now to the Ministry for the Environment, what are we doing? So firstly, we're updating our waste strategy and we're going to have goals and targets in this waste strategy and there will be goals and targets for construction and demolition. We're reviewing the Waste Minimisation Act to make sure that we've got the right levers, the right policy tools to really encourage people or, or force people to reduce their waste. That consultation is coming out in the second half of the year and we strongly encourage you all to contribute and I'm sure that James will send you out all a link to the consultation when it becomes available. We've already increased and expanded the waste levy, and I will talk about that in the next slide. And we're going to improve our waste data so that we'll have a much better idea of what's happening in those class two to five landfills, because at the moment, our understanding is only really good for the class one landfills. We've done an infrastructure stock take, so we know where around the country we have construction and demolition recycling facilities. We're currently doing a gap analysis to see where the gaps are, and then we're going to develop a 10-year infrastructure plan so that we can plug that gap, those gaps with that increased funding that we get from the waste levy. We're developing three-year action and investment plans. So the first one's going to come out late May, which will tell you in much more detail what I've just told you now. Um, and they'll be rolling every three years so that you have a really good sense of what the government is going to invest in, what the plans are, what we're going to be working on. And last but not least, we've got strategic partnerships. So in the waste team for the ministry, we don't actually have anyone allocated to construction and demolition waste, purely because we're kind of at capacity for all our other projects. But we've got another part of the ministry, which is called strategic partnerships, and they look across the whole environmental area and they kind of go, what looks interesting? What can we work with? So they've taken an interest in construction and demolition waste, and they're looking particularly at how Crown agencies can influence change through their procurement. And we've got lovely Rachel here from Kayangora, who's a really great example of what's happening in that space talking today. So, increase in expanded waste levy, no surprises, the levy's going to go up. 
It's going to go up by $10 in July, then it's going to go up to $60 a ton. Now, the aim of this is twofold. Firstly, it's to give us money so that we can fund the infrastructure that we know that's needed. There's no point expecting people to kind of recycle their construction and demolition waste if there's no, no one who can take it and do something with it. And we also know that we need to develop markets. You know, there's no point trying to recycle things if we can't then turn them into something that someone else wants to use. The other um, reason for having the levy, particularly on those class two to four fills, is we need to have a much better understanding of how much waste is going into those fills and what that waste is. So by putting a levy on it, and, and James is giving me the two minute nod, so I'm on to my second to last slide, so phew. So because we know obviously that construction and demolition, there is going to be some additional costs for the industry, and this year's waste minimization funding round, which opens tomorrow, we have uh, made sure that there's an investment signal around construction and demolition waste. Now some of you might be asking, what does an investment signal mean? What that means is that any applications that come um, through the system, which focus on either the redesign of construction and demolition materials or improved resource recovery services, they will get prioritised over other projects. What that means is this is the year to apply because if you apply for a construction and demolition project, we're, kind of, we're going to prioritise your application. Now the fund is always hugely oversubscribed, so even if you've done an application for construction and demolition, that doesn't mean that you'll necessarily get funded, but you've got a much better shot than in previous years. So I'm going to ask the lovely Mary and Leisha to stand up wave to the audience. So they're here today from our waste minimization funding team. So if you're like, yay, I'd like to apply for some money, this sounds great. They're going to be around for networking drinks um, and free for, feel free to get in touch with them. There's no time for questions. Um, Mary and Alicia's um, details are listed there. If you'd like to know more about construction demolition waste, you can talk to me tonight in the networking drinks or you can email Anne. And I'm out of time. Oh, fantastic. Well Setting the place there with a mixture of a little bit of stick and a little bit of carrot. Um, the key things there, probably know what's going to happen, what's coming down the pipe, and also get involved. You know, it's terrible for governments to keep asking for submissions, no one says anything, and then everyone complains when it's done. So it's a good idea to get stuck in and write those letters. Second one, Adam Durant from Colmar Brunson, making waste more sustainable. Right, thank you. Clicker. All Thanks yours. a lot. Um, okay, great. So thank you for, for having me here. Um, so in 2019, we partnered with Auckland Council on a research project, a qualitative research pro project, where we wanted to speak to stakeholders much like yourselves um, about some of the challenges and the issues when it comes to sustainability. Um, so this, what I'm going to show you here is just really scratching the surface, and there's a lot of data and a lot of information that we, that, that we garnered, but I'll just um, give you some top lines. Uh, so in terms of what we did, we spoke to a whole raft of different people. We spoke to architects and builders, project managers, designers, homeowners, a, a whole heap of people. Um, across three stages of the project. So the first phase was talking to people who were attached to a build, to a residential build. Um, the second phase was talking to people who were converted. So people had gone through the journey, um, you know, had, had implemented some sustainability practices. And then we created these, um, I guess, project team huddles where we got a whole heap of different people together from different parts of the industry. Um, and it was almost like a, a bit of an open discussion, right, around what, what they're doing, what some of the barriers are, and what they'd like to see happen within the industry. Um, so I guess the, yeah, just a bit of context, probably no surprise to people in the room here, but the industry is very fragmented. Um, you know, there are a lot of different players and a lot of different, um, I guess, points of view going on. So when you think about a, a build, for example, or um, you know, the industry as a whole, there's, there's a whole heap of stuff going on. And, and you know, people are talking about the fact that um, every link in the chain has to be doing something, right? So if it falls down, if there's one, if there's one subby that comes on site and you know, you've gone to the effort of recycling and then he or she doesn't, doesn't follow that, then, then it undoes everything. So there's a, there's a I guess it's a big, broad, um, you know, um, thing that we need to look at. Also, obviously, very busy, time, poor people. And I think the jury's still out for a lot of people in the industry around whether sustainability is, is cost effective. Um, so lots of concern around having to shoulder the, the cost. Um, you know, what, what is it going to mean in terms of my responsibility, my time, is it something that I'm going to be able to achieve? So I think there's still a job to be done to convince people that this is something that's actually, actually worthwhile and, and is going to save money, potentially. Um, I will say that, I mean, everyone that we spoke to, the idea of sustainability was something that was, was close to everybody. And I mean, people are doing this at home. Um, it's a little bit more difficult when you, when you think about the industry. I think uh, people felt like some of their, their hands were tied. 
Um, we heard before that some of the, the market structures aren't, aren't there um, to support the, these kind of initiatives. Um, so there is a sense that people want to be, and genuinely want to be doing the right thing, but, but feel a little bit constrained about um, you know, be, being able to do that. Um, also, this idea that it's very easy to, to justify not taking ownership of um, waste within the, this, well, C&D waste within the industry because there are so many players involved. Often it's uh, the idea as well, it's someone else's responsibility. If I do it, it's going to be a cost to me, but not, not a cost to that, to that other person. So there's a, there's a bit of um, a back and forth there. So really, I mean, it's, it's a very simple slide, this, but really when you look at the three priorities that, that um, the people that we spoke to in the industry prioritise, it's about time, you know, not, not having the time to do some of these things. Money, obviously, is a huge thing. It needs to be um, financially viable and the effort involved in, in implementing some of these things. So, you know, there's a sense at the moment that sustainability um, and sustainable practices don't really marry with these three um, priorities and I think again if we're going to just um, implement any change that people need to be convinced of that that it's going to you know it's not going to cost money they're not going to be shouldered with the responsibility of the the time and the effort involved in, in putting some of these things together um, so a lot a lot going on in this slide here but this is I won't go through all of these but these are some of the barriers that the people that we spoke to came up with um, you know so the idea of um, you know, whether it's financially viable. Um, lots of talk about no case studies, and, and no one wants to be the guinea pig, and I, I can see that other speakers are going to talk about some of those case studies um, as we go on. But this idea that, you know, ha has it been proven? I want some proof that it, that it works and that it's worth my time and that, you know, fi it's financially viable um, was a big thing that came through. Um, lack of regulation, again, a lot of the people that we spoke to said, you know what, like we just have to, there needs to be a carrot and there needs to be a stick, and they kind of accept that, that that's, that's coming, and that's probably, um, given how entrenched some of the, um, I guess, less sustainable practices are, that's something that's going to have to, have to happen. Um, I think there's a bit of a begrudging acceptance of that that's something that's coming. Um, yeah. So in terms of some of the solutions, so as I've mentioned, case studies is a, is a really big one. People want to see the proof. Um, they want to see that, it, that it's happened before. Both um, negative, and sorry, there's a fly up here that's attacking me. Um, positive, positive and, and, and negative reinforcement, I guess, in terms of incentivising um, you know, people that are doing well and maybe a bit of a stick or, or penalties for, for people that maybe aren't complying as much as they, they should be. Um, you know, change, changing the culture, obviously, is a, is a huge thing. Um, you know, it's, it's not an easy thing to do. Um, and obviously, that's where regulation comes in and sort of forcing people to change. Um, hopefully, some of that social change will come after that. Also, empowering homeowners. Um, again, the, the homeowners that we spoke to, they, they, they love the idea of being as sustainable as possible, but they don't know how to, how to have that conversation with their, with their builders or with their project managers. Um, you know, a lot of them said, I'd love to do that, but, but waste is probably not something that I think about in terms of the overall build. Um, and I, I just wouldn't know. It's a bit intimidating. I don't know how to talk to, to people in the industry. So, um, you know, lots of things that, that can be done. Um, so I think that's my, my ten, 10 minutes. So um, if you've got any questions, I'll, I'll make my details available. But as I say, it's a, it's a very quick sort of um, top read on, on the research that, that we did. So there's plenty more there if you've got any questions later on. Fantastic. Thanks so much. The all important attitudes that feed the system that make us want to do it and it's great to get that sort of idea of what the public think about this because it's often difficult to tell. I just really realised actually in, my, in our haste to get going I didn't do the health and safety thing, you're all adults so I think you're okay but um, the toilets are just upstairs through the, through the automatic doors to the right. If there's an emergency and there's an exit there, follow the green signs. We congregate just out, outdoors by the car park there. Um, if the building's going to fall down, I suspect most of you will know that because you're quite good at that sort of thing. That's all good. Excellent. Into this next session. And in this next piece, what we're going to do is start looking at some case studies from individual businesses and how they're grappling with some of these issues. First up with that is Paul Young from Twin Solutions with a case study from a small building firm. Paul, thank you. Kia ora. Uh, afternoon, my name is uh, Paul Webster Young. My company is Twin Solutions and I've been in business for 12 years. Um, I have a staff of 10 and we're in the residential new builds and renovations sector. Uh, we specialise in complex and high-end bespoke projects. 
Um, hopefully my experiences with waste and construction will shed some light on where I think we need to be heading. So let's start at the beginning. Before I started my company, I spent uh, about eight years working for different construction firms in, in London. It was there that I learned a lot of what has formed the basis of our waste management practices on our current sites. In London, due to the size of the city and lack of space for landfills, skip companies work often in smaller geographical areas um, and all have their own yards. Um, you could put anything in a skip over there and uh, rather than going straight to landfill, it would normally go back to each company's yard and they would sort of, um, they would pick over the bin, separate stuff out, emptied and sorted. Any bricks or concrete are pulled out, metal and wood is separated um, and then they're sent to the different waste streams. Now this is sensible, right? Um, yet they don't do this because they're eco worries of the highest order. Um, they do this because it's commercially sensible. Good bricks, scrap metal, wood, etc., can all be sold onward. Now, fast forward 10 years, and I'm back here in New Zealand, filling skips on various sites, thinking waste is being sorted and recycled, until one Saturday, I'm at the local waste depot on Constellation Drive, dropping off my green waste. And, shock horror, there's those same skip bins being stri um, dumped straight into landfill. What the hell? I mean, I started looking into it some more and making inquiries and I couldn't believe what I found out. All our waste from site was going direct to landfill. Don't pass go. Don't collect any environmental fuzzies. Um, how could it be that London, one of the dirtiest metropolises, um, was greener than us? Where were we getting it so wrong? Now this picture is a skip I walked past in Devonport just last week. Um, there is so much of this that with a bit more thought and effort could be diverted. And it really rips my nighty, especially <laughs> to see common household recyclables like drink cans, drink bottles, just thrown into the rubbish when they could so easily be put into the client's recyclable bin. Now, skip bins require, uh, um, encourage complacency. It requires no thought to just throw it in and no thought is given to where it's going to end up. It was very hard to find other options though and was a bit hit and miss. We started separating on site but invariably that fell apart because it just went to landfill separately. Um, it took me a while until I got on to Junk Run and that was a revelation. Um, on the screen Okay. Oh, no. There you go. Um, on the you can see our latest sustainability <coughs> innovation report from the True Waste Eco Warriors at Junk Run. This is for our current project in Devonport. It covers our last six pickups and totals 46 cube of materials, equivalent of five and a half nine meter skips. Of this, we diverted 35 cube, or nearly four skips, for a 76% uh, diversion rate. How did we achieve this? The things I've found key are, one, team buy-in. My guys are all on board. Um, they often chastise subcontractors for putting stuff in the wrong bin or not following the rules. Um, they saw as we go so we're not double handling and not wasting too much time. And then they enjoy it and reap the rewards when the scrap metal money goes into the Friday beer fund. <laughs> Number two is separation. We have about a dozen 120 and 240 litre bins on site. Um, they all have a, um, they all have their own purpose, whether it's timber, metal, general waste, um, metal sorted into various buckets, um, all pulled nails are collected, all um, flashing off cuts, it's all separated. Um, timber especially is rig rigorously separated, usable timber is stacked for other uses, cedar decking, untreated offcuts go in the firewood bin, that goes into my fire and keeps my family warm through winter. Delivery dunnage is stacked for another time or used for stakes and um, then all other small offcuts are put in the bin ready for um, collection day. There's normally a separate pile by the fence line for longer lengths um, and we're able to dig through it looking for if we need extra bits for packing on frames sometimes. With a skip, these pieces would all be chucked in, 
and with everything else and once it's in it's hard to get it back out. And number three is material efficiency. Years ago um, when I was just out of school I trained as a chef um, and while working at the Sheraton Hotel um, in Auckland on work experience I was working in the garbage department which was like where they did the salads and stuff and um, the head chef there, Steve Thompson, was walking through the kitchen one day and I was chopping capsicum and he looked in the bin as he walked past and he reached in and he picked out the tops of the capsicums that I was chopping and after deriding me for my bad knife skills, he then talked to me about the cost of that capsicum and that throwing the top of it away was actually a waste when it could go in to create a stock which could then create another dish. That stuck with me and now whenever I'm on site, I'm always picking up dropped screws, dropped hardware. Um, but more than that, I work with my guys all the time, getting them to think about material waste. Um, how to make sure we're ordering the right length of timbers for the, 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 the separate jobs. Uh, when they're cutting that timber, what can the offcuts be used for? How to cut the timber to get the best offcuts. Um, and the more we can do to increase the efficiency of our material use has a positive impact on our waste generation. Um, and then I'm always looking for ways to recycle. Can we sell that demolition window um, or that roofing tile first before um, it has to be dumped? How can demolition materials be reused in the current project? That can vary from turning remu rafters into a dining table or breaking up the concrete roofing tiles to go in underneath the slab. Um, I really enjoy being able to find another life, life for some of these materials, especially when that can help somebody else out. Now, how much does this all cost? As you all know, time is money in the construction industry. We typically spend, at the moment, about twice what we used to on waste disposal um, when, when we were using skips, just skips. Um, when I first down, started down this path, I was often giving clients a choice whether we use young grown or whether we use skips, um, and, or sometimes a combination of the two. Now I just use junk run and I simply factor in a larger waste budget. Um, this just makes sense. When the construction industry is generating around 40% or plus of all waste sent to um, landfill, that's not sustainable and we all need to work hard to reduce this. That's why personally I'd like to see landfill costs increase. Um, the cost of waste disposal should reflect the impact that it has on the environment. Then hopefully people will look to recycle more, but more importantly clients will ask more of their building professionals about where or what is going to, to waste. Um, and Hopefully people think twice about just tossing it in. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks very much. And we've reached a point where we do have some time for questions. So if you've got any questions for Paul right now that are you're burning, maybe because he's actually doing it on the ground, which is fantastic and getting into the nuts and bolts. So anyone else who's got questions for Paul right now? Otherwise, he will be around having some light refreshments outside and you can... And get just, just some bravos. Excellent. Go away. Go, go. Uh, does Junk Run provide the containers for you to se uh, separate all your. No, I bought most of those myself. So, Junk Run, you, you just ring them up and they come around and yep. pick up what you've clicked. Their boys load the truck. We often help them just because it's friendly. Um, but yeah, they, they let's load the trucks sweep up, tidy up, they divert it and then separate it in the truck. We separate the majority of it and then they stack it in the truck. Do you pay junk run or do they make money from the materials they collect? Yeah, we pay junk run. Yeah, how much does it cost? Oh, yeah, we yeah, 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 okay, okay, thanks. Yeah, fantastic. It's a great question. Yeah, junk run are here. They're yeah. in lovely luminous jackets and <laughs> t-shirts so you can pick them out easily. Have a chat, see what they can offer you. Anything further right now? No, thank you. Thank you again, Paul. Fantastic.
Next up, Emma Fawkes from McConnell Dowell and Michael Brackhurst from CRL. The CRL and addressing the waste in that process. Just a small little project we've got there, right? Eh? Probably won't generate much waste, will it? Just sweep up. Oh, away you go. The buttons are hidden. Uh, kia ora, kia ora, um, kia ora, Michael Beckist, ahoe. Um, as I was introduced, um, I'm Michael Beckist, I'm the Sustainability Advisor for the City Rail Link Project, um, and there's in the uh, folks next to me. Um, I talk from the client side, from the City Rail Link Limited side, and she talks from the contractor side, um, so we could do a little joint presentation. I'll go through the, the context of the City Rail Link Project quite quickly. I'm assuming most people know what it is and what we're kind of doing, um, except to say it's a very large Project. It's the largest project, uh, infrastructure project in New Zealand at the moment, um, and uh, it creates a lot of uh, use, consumes a lot of materials, and creates a lot of waste. Um, this is just a quick schematic of, um, I guess, what we're doing, um, and it really just shows that. So, so anyway, I'm, I'm going to just talk about contract two, which is a small part of the project because that's complete. The project doesn't finish till 2024, and that goes from. Is there a point on this? goes from Britta Mart kind of along to about halfway up to OTS. It's that sort of Albert Street there. And it was essentially building, uh, there's a little um, drone footage coming up, I'll show you shortly, but it's a cut and cover tunnel essentially, and then reinstating the skate, uh, this, um, streetscape afterwards. So, um, yep, that just explains it there. So, right, uh, and hopefully I can get this to work. So it's a drone footage, will it, it's got an embedded video. Will it automatically play? That's a really good question. Yeah, or not. Oh, here we go. Voila. So this is just um, going up Albert Street, and you can just see the big. Um, what's the point again? Get to work. Uh, the big uh, uh, trench we built there, and the decks uh, on either side. And it's really just building a big trench, putting tunnel, two twin tunnels up there. Um, there's a lot of uh, stormwater and uh, utilities that need to be moved, and then reinstating the streetscape afterwards. So. And that is probably it. Yep. Cool. Right, so what did we achieve um, in terms of waste diversion on C2? There was a hundred and just a slightly less than 180,000 tonnes of waste produced. Um, most of that was spoil and then construction and demolition and a small amount of office waste. We overall achieved a 97% diversion from landfill. Um, spoil was 97%, uh, construction and demolition 95% diversion and that includes 21% of actual reuse of materials which we'll talk about a bit later in detail. And then office waste, the harder one, was 75% uh, diversion. Um, and as I mentioned, spoil is the big chunky one, by far the biggest source of waste. is basically the soil and the, and the stuff you're digging out with when you're um, digging the trench. Um, followed by construction and demolition. Um, office waste is a very much smaller component of the total fraction. And s contract two is quite a small part of the project, um, but obviously very important. And uh, by way of context, overall, we've produced 600,000 tonnes of waste now for the City Rail Link project, and we've still got another, what, three, three and a half years to go, so a lot more to come. So from a client point of view, our key objectives were, um, in terms of with the project and with contract two in particular, was uh, really embracing the Auckland Council Zero Waste Vision, um, so taking that on board. And we're part of, the, we're part of an ISCA accreditation, which is this, basically Sustainability um, Council of Australia. We've signed up to their, um, their rating scheme, which has a whole, I could talk for hours about this, but it has a whole sustainability um, criteria that you need to meet and then you get a score at the end, depending on how you do. And one of the big uh, key parts of that um, sustainability rating is how you deal with waste, how, your waste management. So that really drove a lot of um, good, um, good behaviours, um, not just in waste, but across the whole project. Uh, we had some strong uh, contractual key result areas that we um, included um, to our contractor and that was um, quite strict, uh, quite challenging targets like a 95% diversion for spoil, 90% 90, 90 for construction and demolition and 60% uh, for office waste. Um, we also had a lot of monitoring and reporting requirements so I was on me or someone was on site every, um, every month to check what the contractor was up to just keeping them honest essentially. Um, and then they had a report to us every month on, their, um, on what they achieved. Um, so there's strict, um, always ongoing monitoring and reporting on, on how they're doing against their, their targets. Um, and then I will hand it over to Emma. Thanks, Michael. Um, so I'm Emma Fox. I joined McConnell Dow and led the closeout of our ISCA submission. And I learned a lot along the way around our successes and our lessons learned during that process. Um, so in line with the ISCA waste credits, we 
followed the waste hierarchy, which was a really simple, good framework that was easy to communicate to the team on site. Um, it aligns really well as well with the safety hierarchy of controls where elimination is the priority. So first off, obviously focusing on reducing and preventing waste in the first instance. And then next best thing is reuse, down to recycling, recovering, and in a worst case, going to landfill. So although sometimes on a project as the contractor, it's a lot harder to achieve any prevention or reduction in waste in the first instance. Being an ECI project, our designers were able to get alongside the city rail link designers and we had quite a few wins there in terms of um, our design efficiencies and we reduced the quantum of piles and the diameter of piles required, which in turn reduces the concrete used and then reduces the waste because inherently with any concrete pour, there is concrete waste created. Um, on site, we also encourage prefabrication and our subcontractors like our paving contractor uh, contracts uh, ordered the pavers for the urban realm portion of the works to the exact requirements, um, dimensions required. So that avoided both noise when cutting them on site and the associated waste it would have created. Um, in addition, I think what's really key is um, to achieve sustainability objectives such as waste, it can't just come down to one person. It's like safety, it needs to become everyone on the project's responsibility. Uh, we found a key part of this was incorporating it into all of our documentation as much as possible and not having a standalone sustainability management plan over here that I just coordinated. So um, that's just prompts even in our pre-starts or this is an example of our execution plan or works plan where it just prompted engineers, supervisors, leading hands to, to think about it, planted the seed. So moving down to the hierarchy to reuse, we were really lucky on this project. Um, we had huge temporary works which had value after the project was completed. Um, we sold a lot of material to Egmont Industrial and utilising a, a business like this took away that big issue that we have as a contractor for um, the lack of storage or not having an immediate market for particular materials since they're often specific to projects. Um, the photo on the left is our site team removing one of the last um, whalers from the temporary trench. And the photo on the right is actually one of our own McConnell Dale projects that purchased from Egmont Industrial months down the track uh, for one of our temporary shafts for a tunnelling project. But we didn't have the capacity to store that material anywhere. Egmont also sold lots of the material onto farmers and to Sims and other contractors. And we were able to sell a lot onto C3, which was the next portion of City Rail Link. Continuing reuse, so we um, had a lot of success with Trade Me, just putting stuff up there um, that didn't have any use for us afterwards. We tried Civil Share, and at the time it didn't have a lot of traction, but check it out. It's got really great potential for our industry, I think. It's specific to civil materials, so um, check it out. <laughs> and just as important to mention, I think, is that top right photo. We proposed to City Rail Link to use crushed concrete as our backfill material, which wasn't the original design. And this actually created that big market for a whole heap of demolition happening in the city. Um, and that's just as critical, especially on a big project, that we can provide that end use for these materials. And I think this, these slides show that money still talks. Um, talk to your procurement people, get on board, get alongside them, understand where they can make money and get them on board and make sure they share information with you. And then on to recycling. So choosing waste providers that do those diversion reports, at least Green Gorilla, if not Junk Run, um, ask, ask for diversion reports. And if they say no, say, oh, that's disappointing. <laughs> and then at least these companies are understanding that it's something that's desired by the industry. And then one of the big ones on site was just ensuring bins were really clearly labeled and that they were accessible. People, unfortunately, are still people and bins that are nearby will get stuff chucked in them. 
So that brings me on to our key successes and lessons learned. Educate, educate, educate. Uh, toolbox talks, lunch and learn, or kai and korero, sharing worldwide initiatives like Plastic Free July, informative posters around the site. You don't know when people will read them and make sure it's ongoing. This was a five year project, so we had to make sure that we um, kept up to date, especially with new people joining the project all the time. I think working in this space, you can start to think that everyone knows this stuff, but they don't. So keep sharing what you know um, and what you expect. And site reports are another big one. We had lots of success with. <laughs> I'm running out of time. But uh, anyone could write positives or negatives um, around site or just ideas. And this led to a lot of great initiatives like offcuts of mesh being used for pins when we were shop creating walls, when we were previously purchasing this, um, to integrating composting into our office diversion. And then measure and monitor. Small sites, it's a lot of admin, utilize these, these companies that give you those reports. Um, and just my advice is ignore the rats and mice, go to your key waste streams. Procurement is a big one, so I want to touch on that. <laughs> um, communicate it in your RFQs and embed it into contracts. Um, and monitor performance and support subcontracts so we can get our supply chain really on board. I think that's something we could have and I want to do better going forward. Um, because to have this, we need to have capability within the whole supply chain. And that takes us back to education as well. I'll just pass you on for a very quick wrap up. Yeah, so sorry, we are Michael. almost out of time here. <laughs> um, yeah, it's just to say, um, really, uh, having a waste uh, management plan at start is really good. Having buy-in and education, as Emma alluded to. Uh, consideration of waste avoidance and reuse, um, especially during procurement, and having the client do audits and um, sort of strict uh, reporting and monitoring requirements, um, which were achievable but challenge, uh, challenging, um, was really important. But because um, we ran out of time, I can just uh, point you to, so I'll avoid that one. We can get more information if you go to our website. We've got lots of reporting um, and uh, um, matrices and stuff that we report on, um, and also McConnell Dow has a great site too, so lots of information available there to get some more detail. Thank you. Thank you so much. So just a moment because we do have time for questions, if there are any. So we're doing all right. We're doing all right. And it's good to see both ends of the scale, like eh? from the small business all the way up. There's no, there's no excuse for scale. Going, we're so massive, we don't need to care anymore. You know, that's there's some pretty impressive figures. Uh, anyone got? Any, I mean, that's a big project affecting a lot of people out there. Is there any questions for them right now, or are we ready for um, for the next people? And you can hold those questions till. You meander outside for some snacks at the end of the. Okay, nothing hot, nothing, nothing. Wait, thank you so much. <laughs> Next up, Rachel Trinder from Kianga Aura about policy and procurement tendering and demolition contracts. Thank you, Rachel. Cheers. Take it away. Thank you. Um, sort of koto. I'm Rachel Trinder from Kaiang Order. There's quite a few familiar faces, um, which is really awesome to see. Lots of passionate people in the room, so um, really exciting that there's such a, a great turnout for such an important, um, an important topic. Um, I am a uh, waste minimisation and site clearance lead at Kaiang Order. It is a, a brand new role, um, which shows that um, we are finally. Um, getting the message that um, waste minimisation is, is really important. We're making it a priority. Um, the, the basis of my role is to um, I sit under the sustainability team. Um, some of you will know Rowan Bush. She's the director of that team. Um, and I also sit within the building and innovation standards team within construction and innovation. So um, we're really passionate about innovating and improving um, what we're doing in the construction and demolition sector. Um, the primary, the, the main part of my role is to oversee the shift and disposal of Kainga Order homes um, from demolition um, to relocation and deconstruction. Um, and we have got sustainability um, goals um, and environment strategy, so, so that's just a logical um, move for us. Um, we're, the, I'm also responsible for setting and monitoring waste minimisation targets. Um, right the way through to um, reporting and compliance, which is really important to actually, you know, embed this change. 
Um, and I'm also writing um, waste minimisation policy and completely starting fresh with all of our procedures with regards to um, site clearance and demolition. Um, so I have established a waste minimisation programme um, and part of that is um, sustainability goals. Um, you might have heard or seen some information on a document called Building Momentum. That is our construction strategy um, and part of that you will see environmental well-being. Um, we don't only want to do this and believe we need to do this, um, we also have to and this is what's really important around legislation. Um, we've got, uh, since we, we merged with Kiwi Build and Hobsonville Land Company, we, uh, there's an act called the Kaingaroa Home and Communities Act um, and there's a number of things in there that we need to do, particularly um, with regards to waste and engaging with iwi, etc. Um, so, driving sustainability through site clearance. So, when I'm talking about site clearance, I'm talking about demolition, um, basically. Um, what McConnell Dow just mentioned, we, we're adopting the waste minimisation hierarchy. Um, with regards to our redevelopment site. So where we've got a clearer site to build more houses, um, we will be applying that, that management hierarchy. Um, so w with that, we're committing to relocate existing homes first. Obviously, where typology suits, you can't relocate everything. Um, and if we're not able to relocate them, they'll move down the hierarchy to deconstruction. I see wonderful trail groups up here. Um, I'll talk about next steps um, and, and trials involvement with um, success of some of our pilots. Um, and of course, if we can't deconstruct them due to poor building, you know, condition, material, um, contaminants or site access, unfortunately we, we still will have to demolish. Um, but we do have landfall diversion targets and clauses in our, in our contract. So even if we do demolish, we will still be diverting from landfill. Um, as I mentioned before, we're no longer referring to the word demolition um, anymore. Um, we've changed the title of all of our procedures to site clearance, um, and that is solely because we're not using demolition um, as, as the only methodology to clear our sites. So we, we want to remove that word, um, and, and we're slowly getting there with that, with that culture change. Um, we've set a target to divert 80% of um, site clearance materials um, uncontaminated, obviously, by weight. Um, and that's in all projects in Auckland. Um, diversion targets in other regions will follow, um, and, and there's a reason for that. Um, we heard um, MFE talk about infrastructure gaps, um, in markets, things like that. So there's a reason we've started in Auckland, but we do intend to, to go uh, to other regions as well. Um, we've also set a target that we'll relocate 7% of houses, so in a pipeline of around uh, 1,000, it's roughly 70, 70 houses. Um, we can certainly exceed that, um, but just being aware that not all of our typologies can actually be relocated. Uh, this is the exciting part, um, and is, quite, is a new thing, um, I believe, um, for New Zealand, particularly in Auckland. We, um, we've just gone out to market a wee while ago um, on Get Some Tenderlink to establish a brand new site clearance panel, we call it. Um, it contains three subcategories um, with house relocation contractors, so we're going to be moving more houses. We need a panel of contractors to move them for us. Um, and deconstruction. Um, we've never had a deconstruction panel before. We want to see more deconstruction. Deconstruction should become the biggest proportion of work versus relocation and demolition. Um, that's from doing a wee bit of analysis at our pipeline. Um, and then finally, the demolition um, contractors will still need to be there, but we've changed the contract, and I'll talk a bit more about some of those key changes um, next. We started engaging with industry and our demolition contractors and, and a lot of key stakeholders quite early on. Um, I think around March last year, even earlier, before the first lockdown, we started engaging, saying that this is our strategy, things are going to change. We really wanted that support, um, people to come along on that journey with us. 
Um, and we actually found that a lot of the contractors were in support of what we're doing. They, they acknowledged that we can't continue on the, on the you know, the, the trail that we're on. Um, the panel contracts contain, as I said earlier, waste minimisation targets, um, landfill diversion reporting requirements. So we, we need to, we want to get ahead early before uh, the waste minimisation um, acts come out and, and we are in a strong position to comply with what we have diverted from landfill. Um, and we've also got the introduction of broader outcome clauses um, in, in those contracts, which is really important. It, it's not just about um, you know, contracting and, and, and employing a contractor and, and paying them at the end. It's, it's what broader social wider outcomes we can actually bring along to the project as well. Um, so that way, you know, we'll talk about a, a specific project that Trail did. We are we're having positive outcomes. Um, you know, that reach out to the community through something that would ordinarily just be treated as a project. Um, Soon we will be uh, issuing a request for information, so an RFI out on Tenderlink and GETS um, for deconstruction services outside of Auckland. We're wanting to establish deconstruction um, services outside of Auckland. Um, however, uh, there's not a lot known around the local capability, infrastructure gaps, in markets, all those sorts of things that a few of you have talked about. Um, so, so seeking information on whether or not there are any deconstruction companies elsewhere, um, what recycling facilities do they have, what are their end markets for reuse, um, if we have a pipeline of this much, can they, could they actually deliver, um, and then hopefully work together with MFE to help to look at plugging you know, some of those gaps um, with the view to roll out deconstruction as BAU, not just in Auckland. Um, now, uh, we, we have done some really successful deconstruction pilots, three, three or four now, um, and they all have actually exceeded expectations. Um, and let's not ask about cost-benefit analysis um, just yet, because we've got a bit of work to do, we've got to do more in that area. But so far what we're finding is that these deconstruction pilots um, are actually exceeding our target of 80% diversion from landfill. Um, the first one was a project in Martin Ave that, that Greenway did for us um, and that achieved 85% diversion. Um, the next two projects, and we've got Sai out the back from Trow, we want to wave to everyone. <laughs> um, they did two for us, one in Highbury Triangle um, and one also in Elm Street um, and they diverted approximately 90%. Is that right Sai? Yep, 90%. It's, it's impressive. It just goes to show you that it, it can be done. Um, at Highbury Triangle, the labour totaled um, 8,956 hours. Does that sound right, Simon? Um, and what that's showing you is, at, uh, you know, at one point there are 44 workers on site. So it provides um, employment, um, but also, you know, these buildings are being carefully deconstructed so that the materials can be reused at the other side, rather than just sending a digger through them. Um, and so, yes, 44 workers on site, and despite that amount of people there for labour and the deconstruction method, soft stripping and, move, you know, putting piling things and sorting things. Um, that project still, that project was completed two weeks early and the costs were comparable to a completed, dem to a traditional demolition. So we've got more of these that, that you know, we need to work through, but that's, that's pretty awesome um, interim, you know, findings. Um, so the benefits of Highbury Triangle and Elm Street Pilot went far beyond waste minimisation that I've talked about. Um, Trail employed five locals um, to work on the projects and sent 13 40 cubic metre shipping containers of material to Tonga. And they're being used to help rebuild schools, um, churches um, and houses and cyclone um, proof areas. Um, the photo there on the right hand side is a, is a pop-up market that Trail ran. Um, and they, they provided stalls for free um, and then with the aim of promoting Pacifica and Māori businesses. Um, so um, that's a real awesome um, you know, example of broader and social outcomes. As far as Kayanga Order's next steps, um, in the site clearance waste minimisation part, um, we need to 
complete or formalise our policy um, and publish it. Um, we're in the process of um, making recommendations to award the, the new site clearance panel that I talked about. So those contractors will sign these new contracts that are going to actually embed all of these changes um, and then they'll be formally inducted and, and hopefully we will be doing um, all of this waste minimisation stuff as BAU, at least in Auckland anyway. Um, the construction waste minimisation, um, that's, that's new. Um, there, there are a couple of pilots and things like that underway within Kaying Order at the moment, um, but we are going to establish a formal waste minimisation um, programme plan. So we're only just sort of getting started in that area. Um, and again, that will need to look at all phases um, of the project end to end, um, end, to end um, starting with um, where waste is produced and at the design phase. So there's certainly a lot of work planned in that space. Um, the other thing we will continue to do is collect our landfill diversion reporting um, and, um, and monitor it and keep an eye on it as far as performance and, and how we're actually um, progressing. And that's it. Fantastic. Thanks. Hey Rachel, any questions for Rachel? I won't let her run off just yet. Any questions for Rachel, assuming some of you in the room want some work? Um, you're a big player and there's a lot going on. Ayla, run up the hill. It's great to see the shift in culture across some of these bigger, bigger organisations. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Um, look, I've just got a little question. There seems to be a lot of reference uh, to waste diversion, and that was the same CRL discussion. And I just wonder. Um, once that waste is diverted and can be used for new builds and new construction projects, are there any examples of new builds with a percentage of waste inclusion? So just wondering what that side of the coin looks like. Yeah, so as part of the landfill diversion reporting, we're not only capturing per material um, the weight, but we're capturing where it went. But secondly, in the construction side, there's quite a few limitations in the building code at the moment that prevent um, reused materials being used. Um, part of that construction plan, that um, program plan that I've talked about, um, there's a number of milestones that are already sort of drafted. Um, and particularly, you know, we've got a timber shortage. Why can't we use some of the timber for some of our fencing programs or planting boxes and landscaping, um, you know, concrete, putting some clauses into um, our, our new build contractors contracts that say you must use a percentage of recycled concrete or whatever in the build. We've still got quite a few limitations but that's the end, yeah, the end goal. Yeah. Top stuff. Thanks for that question. Any other questions in the room? There we go. One said, Ayla's gone. Come down. Come down. Front now. Michael. I'm just curious, oh, that's wicked, um, about whether you, for your targets, are they contractual targets and are they like financial penalty, penalties or, um, or inducements to exceed those targets? They are contractual. Um, there, there is no penalties as such. However, we do have the right to, here comes that fly again, the right to, um, the right to audit. Um, and we have, we take good faith and, and have um, a lot of trust in, in the people that we procure and that we work with. Um, so it's just one of those things around ongoing monitoring and compliance. Um, yeah, at this stage, um, yeah, it, it's only the right to audit. But I see Francesca from, um, there she is, Eco Labelling Trust is here. Um, I, don't, I don't know if she's speaking today, um, but, but they're working on um, CND um, waste specifications and there's elements of, um, what is it called, you, sort of like an accreditation that demonstrates they are uh, doing the right things, if, if that makes sense. Yeah. Fantastic, I might hear yeah. from you another time. Yes, you should. Awesome, thank you so much for that. <laughs> Next up we have Tara Moala, Tamaki, Tamaki Rege Regeneration, and Adrian Mendes, Eye Traffic, New Life for Discarded Homes. <laughs> homes you don't find sort of chucked in the hedges, do you? They're, they're quite big, you know. <laughs> It's hard to discard the whole home, I don't know. Thank you so much. It's all yours. <coughs> Me first. OK. 
Okay, kia ora koutou katoa. Um, so awesome to be here. Um, we, uh, I'm Tara and this is Adrian. And I just wanted to also get um, the peeps that are a part of our crew to put their hands up. So put your hand up, Mark, put your hand up. You know you're part of us. Green <laughs> John over there and Claude. Look, they're all shy. So these guys here could be up here with us as well because this was a real team effort. So I just want to give kudos to all those peeps and say thank you so much for all of the... Um, meetings <laughs> that we had to get this to across the line. So, um, yeah, so let's get started. Do I just do that? Yes. yes. No. There we go. Okay, so um, at the end of last year, we wanted to um, do a phase of um, deconstruction and refurbishment in Tamaki. It wasn't our first phase, we've done a few things before. Tamaki Regeneration Company is redeveloping the Tamaki community, which is Glen Innes, Point England and Pamua. So we're significantly smaller than our big sisters over here in Kainga Ora. We only have 2,500 homes and we are going to build 10,500. So we're taking out the old housing stock and we're bringing in the new. Um, alongside that journey, we're actually working really, really closely with our community, and I'm from that community, so I'm incredibly passionate about making sure we work alongside that community. Um, so in 2020, our goal was to trial deconstruction and refurbishment on four of our old houses, and to understand um, if it's viable for us to continue doing this. We've actually moved incredibly fast into phase two and phase three, and our new goal is for as many of our old housing stock to be repurposed. And so that, that's quite fast and that's quite big and um, we're not being shy about that as well. We're, being, um, we're taking it and we're going to go hard. So the um, partners that we have is myself and the Tamaki Regeneration Company and that includes um, the service and system designers that are there, which is about six of us. Um, so we've managed to be able to take a system lens on this as well. Um, then we have um, Glenn and Adrian from the um, iConstruct crew. Uh, we had Richard and Pete from the Ready Karapo House Company, Claude who is here today um, from um, Excess Materials Exchange and Mark Roberts who, from Auckland Council um, who I'm sure everyone in this whole room knows. Um, yeah. Cool. Um, take that. Um, so now I've met the team, let's talk about the processes for the pilot. So initially there were four houses um, in phase one, however, due to water damage, um, there was um, too great a health and safety risk for the house, uh, for the fourth house, and so it wasn't able to be refurbished and was discarded from phase one. Um, this left three houses to be relocated to I Constructs Tainui Road Yard, um, which were relocated on the nights of the 7th, 8th and 9th of December last year. The two houses to be refurbished were at Concord Place, which is a 1980s three-bedroom home, and 16B Concord Place, which is also a 1980s two-bedroom home. 112 Tanifa was a native timber-built house that um, was decided to be deconstructed. So I Contract had some extra helping hands from six Tamaki students. They were year 12s who were in the Trades Academy, and they gained some awesome experience on site. Um, in both the 1980s houses, the wall, broken walls were repaired, um, wallpapers stripped, um, sanded and painted. Um, 16B had many holes in them, but most of the problems came from the exterior of 8 Concord. Um, there are many discussions around whether there should be a full reclad um, for this house, um, but the final decision was to do a partial reclad on the exposed weatherboards so that there wasn't um, any water damage for the house. Um, these houses were put on the market almost three months after they were relocated to Tainui Road. Um, they were sold by an online auction and 8 Concord actually had a pre-auction offer of $35,000. Um, however, this was declined um, to gauge the market interest. Um, due to user error, um, the first bidder did not realise that they had been outbid and it had disappointingly sold at $3,500. Um, yeah. 
60 being cold called, um, did not actually get any bids in the online auction, but the relocatable house company managed to negotiate and sell it for $37,000, which is a good outcome. The deconstruction of 112 Tiny Fire was actually done by Safety First Removals. Um, their experience actually made the deconstruction nice and easy and simple. Um, the denailing and itemising of the materials actually took most of the labour time. That's what we had found. Um, some of the timber contained bora, but most of the salvaged materials range from rimu, matai and tawa. Some of the offcuts of rimu actually um, were made to um, made a gift from the offcuts of rimu material. Um, which is going to be given to the previous house owners of 112 Tiny Fire. So health and safety is integral to any construction site. Um, with a health and safety management plan with the health from a vision, so that's Green John, um, a site-specific safety plan, we're able to identify and mitigate any risks involved with refurbishment and deconstruction. Um, Construct Safe training was done for the Year 12 students as well as weekly toolbox talks to make sure that they were aware of all the hazards on site and we can safely say that we reported no incidents and no injuries. Okay. Awesome. Alrighty, so on to the benefits. So um, the benefits that TRC is most interested in is in around the social benefits. So how can we actually create social, local impact for this? So we actually were, yeah, 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 we want to be able to get these houses off and reduce that environmental impact, definitely. But actually, what can we create in our local community to be able to grow um, economy and social enterprise development? So we had the Tamaki College students come through and help us for the refurbishment. We had local contractors come through, and of course we used iConstruct, which is um, generating local business income. Um, deconstruction, um, the students and our, some of our contractors were able to walk alongside Safety First Consultants, which was really amazing that they allowed us to do that so that we could grow the people that are doing deconstruction, that's what we need. And um, generating, of course, local income from the recovered materials. We're hoping, fingers crossed, to create a salvage yard in Tamaki so that our local peeps can start accessing those and having local people running it and then local people taking things from those salvage yards to build different things. Culturally, um, TRC um, is taking away these homes that have been there since the 1950s and so the impact on the community is actually quite high and so we have um, a a responsibility to make sure that that process is done as culturally safe as possible and a lot of our whānau are Māori and Pacifica. So we have a team which is amazing who come and help support that transition and part of that is their happiness that, they, that their homes actually aren't going to be demolished. They're incredibly relieved about that and they, we had a blessing to help support them with that and, um, and we walked alongside their journey and they are very interested in wanting to see what happens next with their homes that they had generations in. Uh, we also have, are doing some um, building some, for some furniture for, um, for one of those families for the house that was deconstructed um, and we are environmentally of course, you know, we're making an impact because we're not taking them to landfill anymore. Learnings. Cool. So one of the main objectives for this pilot was to get all the insights into refurbishment and deconstruction. So for the refurbishment, we found that not all houses can be refurbished. So like I said before, initially there were four houses and three of those houses were to be refurbished. Um, the decision to take the fourth house was partly due to see if we could refurbish a house that had a water leak. Um, upon later inspection of the house, it was shown that it was in too bad a condition and uneconomic to refurbish, um, so it had to be demolished. Um, this leads into our next point, which is time. So the longer the house remains vacant, the more chance there is, more opportunities for the property to be damaged. For the deconstruction, we found that it is very doable. It is just the time taken to itemise and process the materials. Um, with the right contacts to sell or a place to store the materials like access to a salvage yard, um, there is great social and environmental opportunities in deconstruction. 
Uh, so we have got full stats and full information. We're creating a full report. I'm looking at the writer right now, who is just amazing. Thank you. We're taking that on for the team, Claude. And, um, and that will be public. So we'll be sharing that with everybody. So you'll have full information on what the deconstruction, um, the financials, as well as the, um, the positives and the negatives, the, and as well as the refurbishment of relocations. And so you'll be able to, everyone will be able to get all of that. And the reason why we're doing that is because we're wanting to change the system. So we're wanting to change the whole way that this, this is working. So the clearing of the site, I love to hear what's happening in Kaingaora and I'm really keen to, for us to start working closer together throughout the whole sector to try and figure out how we can change the system. And it has to happen bit by bit. So we're not using the word pilot anymore, we're using phases. Pilots sound like we're going to stop. Um, when we first did, said pilot, they were like, great, and when that's finished, we'll go back to BAU. It's like, yeah, no. So what we're going to do is phases. And so we're actually already moved into phase two tonight. Last night we had three houses move. Tonight we've got three more houses moving to Iconstruct. We're to get moving a total of, um, or we're repurposing a total of 11 houses in this one. The next um, lot is 22 houses, so we're, we're increasing every single time. Every single house that comes through, for whatever reason, we're wanting to see if we can repurpose it. Um, but we need to make sure that we do it sector-wide, because we need to change the system. So how can we do that together? Our next steps, um, create that new system, but we want to have at the forefront social, environmental and community outcomes there. So we want to be able to see how much social enterprises can we create out of one house. How much employment can we create out of every single thing that we can do. So that's what we're wanting to do. And of course, share, share, share. We're going to share all of our information. Yamahina. Thanks, all right, Adrian. Um, let's take a broader look at the value you can get out of a house, not just cash and materials, but what you can do with that material and what you can create. It's, it's amazing. We've got a little bit of time for questions. If anyone's got any questions on that one, very creative approach to it and growing rapidly. If anything crops up, you can always take, um, take the time. Dave, Mike coming. Thank you very much. Um, I love all the social um, benefits, all the great outcomes that came out of the project. Just wondered, going back to card hot, hard cold cash, did um, the 35 grand cover the cost of refurbishing that house? So we have um, an allocated budget at TRC to do a 25k for it per house, per site clearance. And um, that was one of the bottom lines that my boss gave me. <laughs> was like, it's fine for you to play within this as long as it's still within that budget. And it has been every single time. And in fact, in the next phase, it has, what we did was we put all of that budget together for the whole phase. And so that meant for one of the houses, which was two storeys, that was going to be a significantly higher amount to be able to clear that site. Um, but the other ones that were single storeys were cheaper. And so therefore, we were able to just still do that one. So that was how we did it. But yes. Yeah. Fantastic. Win-win. Yeah. Any further questions? Otherwise, you can always um, tap me on the shoulder when it's time for light refreshments, which are coming soon. I know you've been sitting for a long time. Thank you so much. <laughs> Do that thing. Do it. It's a big room. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. And our last one in this section, and then I'm going to get you to stand up and have a wiggle, because um, otherwise you're going to fall asleep. Um, it's a team game. It's Annette Day from Naila Love, Terry Anberry, Linda Castle from Unitech, and Julie, Julie Roberts from Mitre 10. I don't know how they're going to organise it, but we'll see. Go! <laughs> Kia ora koutou. Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to Unitech. Uh, lovely to see everybody here. Um, firstly, I want to test something, because I'm a teacher, therefore you're not just going to sit and listen, you're going to join in. Can you all raise your hand for me? Properly. There we go. Good. Right. You're going to do that again in a minute, okay? That was a practice round. I'm going to ask you a question in a minute and I'd like your votes on it. First of all, I'm going to introduce you to the team. So I am Director of the Environmental Solutions Research Centre, um, which prides itself on trying to tackle two things, waste and pollution, two quite big things. We're passionate about waste and within waste we are also passionate about construction and demolition waste, which is why we're here to talk to you today. Yeah. I've got to get this to work, haven't I? Ooh. Okay. One job. There. there we go, one job. <laughs> I know. There we go, there we go. Um, 
So how this came about is that we were invited, myself and Dr. Linda Kessel, who's sitting at the front there, we were invited to join the construction and demolition waste group that was organised originally by Auckland Council and now by SBN. And we had lots of conversations with lots of contractors about waste issues. And we thought, hang on a minute, we can see a solution coming up here because we're all about solutions in our team. We don't just want the scientific data, we want to actually apply it and see something change, otherwise there's really no point. But we realised we couldn't do it on our own. We needed people to partner with. Hence, lovely partners. So we all went up at the group and we had a chat about what could we do and the first thing that came to mind was money. We need money. And we met Mark Roberts for that. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, <laughs> once we recognised where the money was coming from, we knew we were on to a winner, we started thinking about what are we actually going to do? Now, when I was 10, my dad lost his job. He was a foreman in a bottling company, glass bottles. And from then on, he always talked about how plastics ruined his life. So plastics seemed like a very logical place to go. And we thought, what we might try and do is look specifically at plastics. About 4% of the plastic that goes into New Zealand uh, waste, in terms of C&D waste this is, about 4% is plastic. It doesn't sound very much, does it, 4%? But 4% of many tons is actually quite a lot. Um, and also 4% is quite a lot more than many other countries in the world. So we thought, let's have a go at that. Let's see what we can do in that space. So our aim was broadly to go to site and to find out what's coming into site, where's it coming from, how much is coming, and what type is it. Then from there, we're going to have a think about what we're going to do with it. Now, to do this, we had a team, a fabulous team. Here's the team. We had people from Unitech doing the sciencey stuff. We had the fabulous Naila Love, who were brave enough to actually say, all right, we'll give it a go, we'll come, <coughs> we'll, we'll join in the game. We had Mitre 10, who were happy for us to go back and say, why do you use this plastic? Can't you change it to something else? Can't you do this? Can't you do that? And we were amazing. Um, Green Gorilla, at the end of it, we said, we've got this much plastic and it's this much type, what can you do with it? That was the conversation about what to do when you can't get rid of it at the beginning. What do you do with it at the end? And, as I said, the money man, Auckland Council. Thank you very much. Um, the other thing we brought into this were our students, because we believe that what we're learning, our students should learn. So we brought our students in, and they learned a very good lesson in saying no to jobs that involve diving into skips. <laughs> they learned that at the end, not at the beginning, thankfully. So thank you to our students. Oh, I've done it again. Oh, God. <laughs> no! It's all right. Every teacher has to do it at least once, right? So we assessed, did you memorise all the slides? Yeah. <laughs> When's mine coming up? They will be available at the end. They will. And a video, isn't there a video? There's a video on the side. Yay, look at that. There you go, it'll get back up. And with that, I will pass you over to the lovely Annette Love. Annette Day, who's going to talk to you about their involvement. Hi guys, um, so yeah, Naila Love, so our business plan is to uh, concentrate on waste, um, so it's coming from the top down, and we've actually set KPIs for our waste by weight being diverted from landfill, so we raised our hands and said, yeah, we will give it a go, yeah, and we will partner with you and see how it goes. So um, we were managing and we have developed a waste partnership list which has helped us achieve um, to where we've got to today. So plastics, um, it's used all around the site, everywhere. Um, it's purpose made for construction components. Um, our building our pilot program and what went well, so we had three bins on sites on three different sites and we collected in two rounds. The first round was for two months and then the second round was for five months. And this collection helped us get right from the start of the project to the finish of the project, but it collected all on different projects, big projects and little projects. Um, we had lots of engagement from staff. It was hard, but we've uh, had some learnings from that. And then uh, we have weekly progress uh, reports what didn't go well, uh, our waste bags were repurposed. Uh, we couldn't find some some days. And then uh, we had to stop during COVID, so we lost a bit of momentum, but we did get it back. Um, so one big thing is changing attitudes. Uh, so uh, I think there is a good lot of people out there uh, that do care about what the environment, what we're doing with the environment, um, what, and want to do the right thing. Um, it's just a matter of us setting it up for everybody to follow. Uh, we have found the plastic waste commodity is only recycled if waste businesses can make money. Um, so changing attitudes again, uh, we need to change. Uh, 
us, that's Naylor Love and all the other construction companies, and don't wait for the end of the cliff um, where the waste people actually take it away to sell it. So how we are dealing with it, um, changing the specifications, talking to the architects, uh, deleting plastic packaging, um, changing methodologies, and partnering with plastic makers to create a circular economy. Um, so we've taken what we've learnt here and we're now dealing with another company called Mali and we're collecting just their pipes, which is an ongoing cycle. Uh, also, sorry, sorry, I've got photos. <laughs> so uh, this one here is our bag that um, we had to tie down in the end to, to collect. Um, all the different plastics that are on site, there is lots of different plastics when you, when you have a look at the whole construction. Um, the, the group at the top there, dumpster diving um, for plastics. Uh, so, yeah, we've learnt our lessons there. It's, don't chuck plastic in the bins. And, yeah, we literally had lots and lots of plastic come off sites. So, yeah. Thanks, Annie. All right, so as Annie said, we actually do two audits and we're going to present you today just the results of the first audit, although I'm just going to give you a little hint about what we found in the second audit. Um, we had those three sites um, and Naylor Love were kind enough to collect the plastic for us and take them back to their depot, at which point we went down and we had the job of drying the plastic, weighing the plastic, taking little samples and going and getting it analysed. Um, we were really looking at the plastic types, the plastic volumes, and it really wasn't just about the fact that we could do the science, it really was the fact that we had monthly meetings and when we all got together around the table, drank a lot of coffee, talked a lot of rubbish, but also got things done. Talked about what was working well, what wasn't working well, what else could we try, where could this go? And that was actually really important. And when Julie talks in about my to 10 and the things that they've established, they are amazing. And that all came about from chats around the table. Um, at the moment, we've got two reports being produced. Hopefully they'll be published soon and we will share them with the team. So on to the science stuff, get your geeks out right now. We basically took the plastic and we took it for analysis. We used FTIR, which is basically Fourier Transform Infrared Spectroscopy, say that after a glass of wine. Um, basically, it's molecular fingerprinting, so we could establish what types of plastics we were looking at. And from those, we were able to establish that plastics were really coming from three groups, and this is where your left hand's going to come in handy. These three groups were thus. They were either coming from plastic wrap that goes around buildings, that's number one, plastic products, so things like plastic pipes, and then plastic packaging, so the stuff that normally gets a lot of blame, stuff like you've got a box of screws in a plastic box. So that's plastic wrap, plastic products, plastic packaging. Right, show of hands please. How many people in the room thought that we found that most of the plastic came from plastic packaging? Okay, good, that's about third. How many people thought it came from plastic wrap? and mass, it doesn't make a huge difference, so just focus on one, it's probably easier rather than getting confused. Um, plastic products, which is the dark blue one on here, you can see just topped out, being higher in terms of proportion um, than the others. Protection of buildings was second. Plastic packaging, actually not very much, which for me, as a, not really a construction person, I, I was quite surprised, because for me it's all about what you bring in from the shops wrapped in plastic, right? So that was in my head. I was quite surprised by that. Now, when we moved on to the second audit and we put everything together, we found that that actually didn't change. In fact, looking at all of the audits, thank you, we found that about 60% of all the plastics that came in was from the plastic products. And it came from a particular stage of construction, and that was right at the end. And the end of it when you put it in the fancy bits. That's when it came about, not demolition and not foundations. Um, most of the plastic was polyethylene. Um, so Mana 10 recognises that we're probably part of the problem um, and so we worked with our supply community around how we can assist our customers in this process. Um, we have two challenges, one is that we need to engage with our customers and create change with them and then secondly it's around our um, the, the, sorry, um, it's around protecting the product with rain days. Um, so some of our timber does need to be protected and some of it um, it's unnecessary. 
So we had a workshop internally and um, we came up with a really simple idea, um, thanks to Simon, who's here um, today. And it, yeah, he does actually need credit for this. So we literally put a small question on our online ordering saying, would you like the packaging or not? And 90, uh, sorry, 97% um, of our community said no. Um, and today that's still sitting between 96 and 97 per cent. So it's a really strong message from our customers that they don't actually want the um, packaging. So what are we doing next? Um, MITRE 10 has launched our sustainable packaging guideline policies. Oh, sorry. It's okay. Um, so we um, are working with our suppliers around um, getting rid of unnecessary packaging. Um, we're also working with Naila Love on alternative projects and diversions, so we're looking at other waste streams that we create and how can we um, get rid of that. And um, we're also looking at general end-of-life um, projects, so what can we do um, from a sustainability perspective around working with all of our um, supply community. Okay, and just to finish there, um, the design and trial of the permanent plastic collection bins um, so the, the photo that you saw was just a temporary one. We are in the process of designing a permanent one to take this further for every, roll it out on every site. And um, the other thing is um, a permanent training. So with the statistics that are going to be included um, for the second round of the Unitex, uh, we're going to make up posters and we're going to have the toolbox talks and we're going to get our staff right into plastics as a, a separable, a separate waste diversion. All right. So, yeah. All right, so that's pretty much the end of our presentation. We just wanted to say that really Annie should be given a big pair of pants and a cape because Annie did such an incredible job. She was so brave as a contractor to stick her neck out and work with us to achieve some incredible, incredible things. And we're really proud of what's happened. Um, what are we going to do next? Well, we, we want to carry on with this because it's so exciting. The first thing we want to find out is we recognise that plastic comes from different stages, from different places, and what we haven't been able to do is see a project from start to finish. We've been given the beautiful opportunity of some new buildings being built in Onehunga, part of the Onehunga school rebuild, and we are auditing that, and we're going to audit from start to finish to get a bit more detail, hopefully sponsored by Auckland Council. We haven't asked them yet, but they <laughs> The next thing we want to do is ask you all, anybody in the room, any contractor, anybody who is brave enough, we are here. We would love you to come to us. We would love you to join with us. We will make it simple. Annie is even going to come and help too and prove that we're not scary to work with. We'd love you to come to us. We want to help you to solve your plastic issues. We are happy to come out and audit. We are happy to work with waste minimisation on CMD sites. We've been there, we've done it, we know how to do it. We're still learning, but we'd really like to learn with you. If you are keen, please, please go on to esrc at unitech.ac.nz and join our team. And thank you very much in advance to Shannon and Nina who organised lots of this today. I can't see them, but thank you. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much. It's obviously it's a collaborative game, isn't it? It's a team game. Has anyone got any questions for the team? It's, it's not seen as a commitment to work with them just yet, but they will probably yeah, badger you afterwards. Ayla, <laughs> go. Hi, yeah, thanks for that. That was really good. Um, I'm just wondering, with a nail of love, how did you make plastic a priority? Because I find plastic features so little in our statistics, since they're often based on weights, not volumes or such things that would really show it as like the biggest waste stream. So sometimes it's hard to get the construction projects to really focus in on plastic. Uh, okay, so collaboratively we thought of waste, the plastic, as a, um, a single collection item for waste. Uh, yeah, it, just, it just happened, really. Yeah. yeah we yeah. had conversations with so. Angarilla about what they could take. And we realised that plastics was one of those things that went into the upper and they couldn't really do anything with it. And we thought, well, you know, there's a lot of people who are out there tackling those things. Let's tackle the other. Cool. It is, it is hard, but once you, uh, once you start, you can't stop. So what, <laughs> what, what we'd like to bring to the group now is uh, the, at the front end, architects or designers, um, you know, some visionary people that uh, can change specifications for us so we're not having to use uh, plastics. Um, if we don't buy it, then we haven't got the waste stream at the end. Yeah. 
Fantastic. Any further questions? It's turning into a meeting of Dumpster Divers Anonymous. <laughs> Ayla. Oh, she's gone the other way. No, it's right. You'll be off. Question for the teacher. Um, curiosity, have you looked at other uses for plastic? Like, I know they're making these uh, fence posts for farms, etc. Our industry uses a lot of plastic. I'm wondering if that plastic could be a recycled plastic over new. That's a very good question. Um, some of the plastic that we, well, 80% of the plastic that is on site that we collect is um, dirty. So we have to think of ways of cleaning it to then send on. Uh, and yeah, I'm always open to find some other waste partners uh, that collects plastic or you know, we can give plastic too. So maybe we could talk later. <laughs> Fantastic. It's been a talk. Like I'm sorry we're out of time. Your question maybe grab them over a little snack. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, right, whilst we're doing that, we're just going to head into our last blitz of four, five-minute quick-fire uh, um, pieces. But before we do that, maybe if we stand and give them a stand ovation just to get some blood flowing <laughs> through the people. So for those main case studies, just a big round of applause. Just warm. Excellent. We will get sugar soon and you are ready to roll. So if you take a seat for us, we have now got Jed Finch from X-Frame. We're going to talk to you about a reusable framing system. Some innovative. Don't, don't lose me. Come on. Okay, sit you down. It was just a stand up and sit down again. It's all right. Don't get out of control. Just start. Okay, so I'm from um, Victoria University in Wellington, and I've been working on a research project um, in collaboration with Building Research New Zealand, um, Victoria University, and um, the Building Institute for the last four years about how to develop top of the cliff solutions. So exactly what we're talking about: how do we stop the waste going from site? What does the next 50, 100 years of buildings look like? So just some really quick recap for all of you: we're the largest consumer of materials, we're the largest producer of solid waste and we're also the largest single producer of emissions as a, as a whole sector. Now this, these three statistics present a really alarming problem, that it's a, it's a process, it's a linear consumption model, right? We're taking, we're throwing things out and we're not recovering any of those materials. And so we end up with problems like this, this is in Wellington, Paddington development, if you've walked past it, huge amount of townhouses going in and none of the materials on site being recovered at all. And the problem that we're facing is we want more energy for high performance buildings, right? We want to live in warm, dry, healthy homes. But the decisions we're making to get to those buildings look a lot like this. Composite products, something that we call a petrochemical sandwich, right? Materials that are generally composites laminated together to achieve a, an airtight, thermally efficient membrane. If we want to achieve end of life de deconstruction, and if we want to achieve end of life deconstruction in a manner that those materials can actually be reused, this sort of process has to stop, and it has to be replaced by something that's designed from the start to be recovered. So we've produced a building product called X-Frame. It's a self-braced, reusable, interlocking, modular, prefabricated framing system. Um, the idea with X-Frame is it takes a ubiquitous product, plywood, it turns it into a high-value system that wants to be recovered. The way we do that is we separate the layers of a building. So you know how I was saying before we have a petrochemical sandwich? What we've done is we've pulled that apart into independent layers that adapt as they would in the building. So, for example, if your internal linings are getting changed every 10, 15 years, then they can be clipped on and off, and that can happen without the glue, screws, and nails that would normally fix them to a building. It's 25% less material, so it's inherently more efficient use of material because of the diagram geometry. Um, and again, it's this platform technology. It's designed for all of these other recyclable, recoverable systems to join on and come off and save people time. So um, obviously it's 12 standard parts. Um, there are more architects always want to come up with something custom, so we allow for that in our workflow, but it's based around this core system. And it is based around building science in the sense it's a technological response to this problem. So here's an example of this independent layer system. We've got this cavity batten system that's prefabricated and bolts to the side of the building, so that becomes a separate element. 
This isn't just you know, academic research, this is applied research, so we're going out and building these things. Here's a magnificent product from a Bodo, it's a thermally modified plywood. It replaces the need for the CCA in a normal plywood barrier, can be recovered, taken off, reused. The workflow here, we use distributed manufacturing, so CNC routers in almost every joinery shop in New Zealand. We turn our flat sheet of plywood parts in 30 minutes into a panel. The yield is about, um, one sheet of plywood will give you about one square metre of frame, roughly. Um, we have these standard plywood parts that can either be put together into panels in a factory or taken to site and put together on site, depending on what you're doing. Here's an example of those panels. So again, it's all standard parts. We can customise it. Here we've got a, a raked wall panel. The idea is, is that you might have to modify the pitch of that wall panel, and when you do that, the only thing you have to do is adjust those four plates on the top of the panel rather than throwing the whole thing out or breaking things down into small bits and not being able to make it bigger yet. Finished buildings, we've done commercial fit-outs in um, Wellington and Australia. The commercial fit-out market's fascinating because you know they have such a quick turnover of materials and products, and so this is a, a great use case for it. Um, we're venturing into this standalone load-bearing construction platform. Here's a little um, prefabricated 10 square metre sleep-out in um, Galloway. Here's another project in Adelaide, South Australia. This one's 20 square metres. Um, fascinating photographs mid-lockdown in New Zealand with a um, builder with a nail gun wandering around his house and I was panicking, but we got there. <laughs> Here's the latest stuff, um, hot off the press. Um, we're going 50 square metres and the next project's 400 square metre show home for an apartment building that's going up in Adelaide. We've got um, funding, we've got interest, um, and we're starting to roll out, so it's really exciting time. What does this mean for waste? Um, up front, we're sequestering a lot of um, carbon. Obviously, we're a timber frame building solution, and we're timber outside, we're timber inside, we're timber everywhere. Um, it's an 85% reduction in waste up front. So the way we achieve that is our sheet efficiency when we cut is 95%. So 95% of that plywood sheet is getting turned into a panel. The rest of it's sawdust, it's untreated timber, so we can send that to um, recovery schemes, and we can just treat the timber that we need to. 95% of all materials are recoverable through our deconstruction tests, but the more important thing is that number at the bottom. It's two-thirds less time to recover the materials in a high-value manner from the house. There's no denailing, there's no taking things away from site, spending six months cleaning them up, and there's no turning it into furniture. A house turns into a house, which is what we're really excited about. Cool. That's it. Thank you. I'm loving that. If you want to find out more about that, call him in the snacks section. And that's the innovation, that's what we want to see, is like clever ideas, and we want to share those as wide as we can. Now, Stephanie Wade from Habitat for Humanity, developing new destinations for waste. Where could waste end up? Or would it be waste anymore? Just resources? Probably. Uh, uh, my name is Stephanie Wade. I'm the Construction and Demolition Procurement Manager for Habitat. Um, a newly created role I've been in for the last 12 months uh, with the help of Council Women's Funding. Uh, I've worked for Habitat for the last three years and prior to that I worked with Habitat on our Papakainga housing development. Um, so just, um, just a couple of things with it around Habitat. We are a global housing charity. Our vision is a world where everyone has a decent place to live. We have a number of second-hand stores throughout New Zealand. We call them re-stores, five in Auckland. Um, and we have a number of uh, home repair advocacy programs and home ownership program. In terms of the last 12 months, uh, we've increased our focus around building more relationships, developing relationships in the CMD industry, uh, and procuring more of those items. We have um, over 20 donors that have contributed um, these items. Uh, we've been able to raise around $60,000 in funds for the sale of these items through our restore. And where we can, we um, do use some of those items on our home repair programs, um, which is also equated to around 54 tonnes in weight. And that's range from um, flooring tiles, carpet tiles, uh, kitchen sets, timber, to windows and general household items in some cases. Uh, we can pick up those items with uh, our little free tin trucks, however we are limited to these small trucks. We do have a um, tail lift, but we also have our main side out in Otara, where we can receive all these deliveries as well. Um, and, and as well as our programs, we also have volunteer run projects 
This is our upcycling project where our volunteers will go in and uh, restore or revamp donated items and I'll tell them through our restores. This is one of our um, lovely volunteers. This, this is her, these first two or three um, photos are of her first two um, items that she's recycled on her own. She's an engineering student and she comes in to help and volunteer with us in her free time. Um, and then that last photo at the end is one of the um, key volunteers who recycles in our Pamira restore. So encouraging a lot of uh, reuse as well. We also have our pallet project where our volunteers will come in and strip uh, pallets and make small items that we can then on sale and raise more funds through our store. Those range between uh, birdhouses to planter boxes to shelving. Um, and then we also work with a lot of local groups. We've worked with this is the Key Crew as well as our, uh, one of our volunteers. We've worked with the local colleges, um, youth at risk and youth mentors. Um, so also encouraging reusing, repurposing. Um, we also have our curtain bank as well. Um, they also have our Rags for Bags project where they make bags um, out of curtain ends that we can't use in our homes. Um, and they also make uh, door snakes for families um, as part of our Healthy Homes initiative. We try and minimise draft in the homes as well. Um, this is the Ōtarakai, or the Ōtara Marakai group. Uh, they work with the Ōtarakai village. Really, we're offering land space for them to grow vegetables and feed local families. Um, they are really great, this, this group of people. They do everything themselves. They've built these plant boxes themselves. Everything's recycled, right down to the nails they use. Um, they also have, they harvest water. Um, they have their little compost, and they also have a worm farm as well. Um, and then for us, just really, um, our, our aim is to develop more waste uh, solutions on site. We're starting with uh, refreshment stations in our volunteer day or our build days. A lot of our um, sites at the moment for our home repair uh, are working with families who don't have falls and walls and, and, and showers and things like that, so a lot we can't recycle. But where we can, we will pull them through to our resources. But we are starting with at least our volunteer refreshment stations and aim to work towards a zero waste working environment as well. And that's it for me. Any questions, yes, I'll contact details here. I'll be around for a little while at the end as well. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Stephanie. Thanks so much. Awesome. awesome Womble style creativity. You can turn anything into anything else. That's what we need to do. Renee's already making her way here. Renee Walcott from Jacobson about product stewardship scheme and a skip the skips update. Yes. Away you go. Uh, kia ora everyone. Um, I have to do this. Uh, so as Andy just said, my name is Renee from Jacobson. We are a flooring and building systems specialist company. So we import um, and distribute a range of products and work in the commercial and in the residential sector. Um, and so what I want to talk to you today about is a little bit about our journey around tackling flooring waste. Um, and it's definitely been a project centred around collaboration with partners. So a little bit of um, an example around the problem that we're facing across the entire industry. So it, we estimate there's about 9 million square metres of flooring that's installed in New Zealand every year. Obviously everything becomes waste at end of life, so that's you know, the really big numbers. But even thinking about the waste from the offcuts, we estimate it's around 8% of um, every bit of flooring that is installed. Uh, goes to waste. So if you, you know, base that on 9 million square metres a year, that's 720,000 square metres a year of flooring just going to landfill. And we fall in that other category too. So even though we're a small percentage of the, you know, C&D waste stream, um, it's still large, it's still huge numbers. Um, part of the problem is it's a huge range of products in the market across a, a wide range of suppliers. Um, and all of the different products are composed differently I mentioned the suppliers, and so it's you know a lot of facets to this value chain. And even though a lot of product, and it's not just flooring, will say that it's recyclable, we don't have the systems here to recycle them. So um, at the moment, well, you know, some of these product stewardship schemes are trying to address that, obviously, because it can't be separated and recycled by the existing recyclers. 
So our challenge, um, and we really, really wanted to think about this through the waste hierarchy framework, but we aren't manufacturers and we aren't installers. So we work with many supply partners and different product types, um, but you know, all of our different installers and partners, they can't do this on their own either, so we kind of um, recognise that we're best positioned in our value chain to enable the recycling of waste flooring, even though we're not the ones actually touching it. So that's part of our challenge. Um, so we, we looked at it and said, how might we take waste flooring and reform it into something of the most value possible? We did actually spend a lot of time looking at the local market for opportunities, doing research, and I, I really feel like this is a journey, and so that work will continue to look for, for opportunities, and if anyone has any ideas, please do get in touch. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's definitely an evolution, and oh, it's in there twice. Um, the solution that we're working with at the moment is working with our suppliers. So this is a bit of a document on, or a, a flow chart on how it works. So as the importer, we sell it to the installer, the installation offcuts, we provide a collection bag. So that was kind of one of our challenges was it can't cost the installer any money to be part of the program or they won't participate. And we might need to make it really easy. So we... Um, we did a pilot or a stage one <laughs> process um, last year where we worked with some of our installers, provide them with bags free of charge, and then when they're full, we will go and collect them from their sites um, at our cost. Then we sort them at Jacobson, so because we're dealing with multiple products and multiple suppliers, we didn't want them having to try and separate them themselves between six different streams, so we do the sorting. Then we hold on to that until we have enough to ship back to the individual suppliers. Um, and then our suppliers are really fantastic um, and are putting that product back into making new materials. So for us, that was the highest value um, use of that product. Um, and then comes back to New Zealand. And then a really important part of it also is working with Habitat for Humanity, where we have the opportunity for the product to be reused, then we... Um, work with Habitat for Humanity so that it can go to the restores and be sold and um, that can go towards helping their housing projects. Oh, so here's some pictures of us doing, um, doing a sort with our bags um, and the kind of waste that we, we find in the bags and um, just touching upon the Habitat for Humanity piece again. Um, so I mentioned that we have partnered with our suppliers to provide this and we really focused on our largest suppliers as well. So um, Target and Shaw make up a, well over 50% of our business, so we really focused in that area. Um, and I wanted to touch on too, it's been really interesting through doing the journey of how you can start to create change outside of New Zealand as well. So um, Tarket, who are a global um, producer, they are really looking at our system in New Zealand to see how they can apply it across Australia as well because they recognise that there's a need but um, they aren't as far ahead at, as, at, at, at advocating for that as we are. Um, so Shaw Contract, who are a large US manufacturer, and they've been doing recycling of end-of-life products for a long, long time, but they never thought about the installation offcuts. So they, when we started engaging around this conversation, they said, oh, you know, that's really easy to do. Um, and so they are extending that program as well internationally. And Regupol are a company in Germany, so they do recycling in Europe, but we're the first country that they are trialling this program with as well. So it's just cool to see... Um, some change beyond our borders as well. So what are our challenges right now? Um, unfortunately, a lot of it still works in the BAU type system with all of our, you know, we need to engage with all of those stakeholders. We need um, our installers to participate in the program and they're really keen to, but they just get into the usual way of working. Um, so we need, you know, Emma talked about it before, we need the architects, we need the developers, we need you know, everyone in the system to be asking about it and to be putting that pressure on to create the change. We also want to grow the program with more um, installers, so we have um, expanded beyond Auckland now, but we, we want to do more um, and look at more products and more suppliers. Um, and one of our challenges relates to contaminated waste, so unfortunately this is some of the stuff that 
comes back and obviously we can't do anything with that if it's um, been contaminated and health and safety risks if things like blades are being thrown in and people are digging in to try and sort that waste. Um, yeah, I wanted to touch on Skip the Skips as well. So just briefly, this is a program that we are um, involved with. We're not leading it, but it's um, definitely being supported by the Waste Minimisation Fund and working with Kainga Ora and all of the, the partners up there on the slide. Um, and it's all about developing methods for reducing the quantity of material entering the waste stream as a result of residential construction. So um, there's been some projects done I think Precision and Construction are here too, and they're involved around measuring that baseline waste, um, and then an intervention workshop, um, and to put in place reduction measures and monitor and measure the new sites being built. Um, and just lastly, other critical focus areas. So for us, obviously, our biggest levers are who we choose to source from, and what we source, and what we promote. So that's something that we think about all the time, and. Um, things like, you know, we're, we're working now with the residential carpet product and we'll be adding that into our program during the year. But, you know, that sort of a product does have far less waste and it can mean that things can be removed more easily and um, reused. Um, obviously the longevity of the product, and that was touched upon earlier as well, and the maintenance involved with the product. Um, and then we look at things like the operations of our business, um, our team culture and education, and just constantly being proactive to look for better outcomes. Lastly, I just want to say a big thank you to Mark on behalf of for Auckland Council. Um, we did receive some funding through Waste Minimisation Innovation Fund, and to James from SBN, just always there as fantastic sounding boards to um, seek advice from. So thank you. Thank you. Jacob's some finalists in the uh, Sustainable Business Awards as well. They're launching next month. Look out for that. So if you've got clever ideas, come to us and we'll celebrate the hell out of you as much as we possibly can. Last but not least, we've had Kevin. That's us. Go for it. Lucky last, everyone. Woo, we made it this far. Kia ora, everyone. We are Kelly and Amy from Refab Heavens. It is so exciting to be here in this room with all of you and just be talking about these amazing sustainable business procedures. Um, as a company, we at Refab Heavens actually capture the construction waste and transform it into really beautiful, bespoke cabins. Um, so we really tap into two of the domain streams, one being new build, which allows us to use a lot of our um, framework, and then what really excites me is the demolition stream. So we're able to capture these really beautiful, bespoke antique windows and doors and native timber flooring that would otherwise be headed off to the tip. Speaking of just the tip. Uh, so I'm not going to talk your ear off about the waste issue. Obviously, everybody in this room at this point is an expert on the topic. At least I assume so. Um, but I will touch base on a few just key things that are relative to our business and how we operate. Over 50% of our landfill in Auckland is from demolition construction waste. We've already talked about that. But to put it into perspective, that's about 800,000 tons last year. And we know that that number is climbing. Now, this is going to come off a little bad, but we're actually really excited about it. And the reason is because that's most of that is stuff that we can use for our construction, which kind of brings us to our vision moving forward. So as a company refab, our scope is so much more than just building and selling cabins. We are so focused on the circular system that we've all been listening to and talking about today. And so what we're really focused on is capturing the materials at the source, which Paul Young earlier, hello, we'll be friends later, <laughs> has been doing, and including their love with their plastic. So this is a working model. And we're also lucky enough to receive flooring from the lovely Jacobson as well, which is really incredible. Um, and especially with Junk Run, I think that they dropped off three loads today. So, um, yeah, we're able to really show how this is working, that this is a functional model. This works, this is a working example of how we can capture those ways and turn it into affordable housing solutions. Now, we are a startup business, which means it's not all fun and games and funny hand gestures, though I do like this one. Um, we have challenges, just like any startup, particularly in two areas. The first one is 
funding. I'm sure everybody in this room can appreciate that. Uh, we are very new. We started in August. So we're actually not qualified for a couple of grants. Most grants want you to be open for about a year or so, we found. And even when we do qualify, you actually only have about a 10% success rate of getting that funding. So that's definitely a challenge that we're tackling head on this year. Go team. Woo! <laughs> 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 rehab, rehab. <laughs> that demolition waste and construction waste to our front door, which is something I think we heard like what, two or three times today, the question has arisen, where does all it go? That's a wonderful concept. We love to separate the wood from the windows to my grandmother's bed, but where does it go? Bring it on, we want that waste. And that is where you all come into play. That's right, so as Amy is touching on, we are a very small fish in a very large pond. But looking at all of your faces in this room, like we are all in this together. So I guess where we're at, we have already partnered with some incredible people that are really helping this vision come to fruition. But if you're like sitting there and you're feeling like this little urge, this little like light bulb moment, if you're literally going, where can I put all of this waste? Come and chat to myself, Kelly, Amy, and a wonderful director, Andrew, who's hidden somewhere in the back there. We will be coming to these light refreshments that have been on offer. Um, or better yet, come stop by at our office at 606 Great North Road um, and come and check out our beautiful cabins. Thank you so much for all of your time. Um, really exciting to be in this room. Thank you guys. I want to live in one. That sounds fantastic. Um, so we're coming to the end, come towards the end. I'm just going to get, want to get Mark Roberts up um, from Auckland Council, apparently the man with all the money, um, <laughs> to, to tie it all together for us in just uh, some final comments. Kia ora tato. Look, um, very quickly, I just want to um, thank you all for coming um, to join us here today. It's really um, been incredibly encouraging um, to, to see the number of people who've, who've, um, who've expressed interest and in, in come out to, um, to, to learn and um, see what other people are doing. Um, I want to just acknowledge uh, the help that I've received from our Sustainable Business Network, from James and Lauren, um, and from Terry ann and the team at Unitech for providing a venue for us, otherwise uh, obviously we'd be out in the rain. And also um, a mention for our sponsors, Jacobson, uh, Becker, and also Naila Love um, for like literally making sure that it happened. Um, and also a big thanks to our presenters today and um, for, for coming out and um, sharing what they've been doing. Look, um, in this room there's an incredible amount of um, knowledge, information, data, capability, capacity, and, um, and we've seen today the hard work that's going into this. So I think um, the kind of the, the future is bright. Um, there's an, a massive drive going on, and um, you guys are, are driving that, and um, I really do congratulate you. And um, please, if there's, it, like, my phone is on all the time and my emails are always open all the time. If you want to kind of contact us and talk to us, um, we'd love for you to do that. Um, we also have a group, a working group, which came out of the last seminar two years ago and they meet uh, about every quarter or so uh, to get together and look at things and projects and um, spawn little things that they can go off and work on. And um, if you want to be part of that, it's a quite a, look, it's a pretty casual kind of group. It's not sort of hard on stuff. If you want to be part of that, please just let us know. And um, please hang around for some refreshments afterwards. Thanks right. very much. Thanks so much. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Thanks too to our partner, Master Builders. Um, do go out, enjoy some light refreshments. Meet our lovely SBN staff that will wave at you there at the front if you haven't, don't know them already. Please hand back your lovely lanyards. They will be repurposed and reused, we'll be reusing time and time again. And watch this space. We hope to do more in this area um, with all of you jumping in and sharing the energy, sharing the love, sharing the information. Have a great evening. Thank you.
Um, but I think she's trying to get hold of um, Mark.